Lord, we thank you for this time in your presence. We thank you, Lord, that you never change. Lord, that you're a rock, dependable, ever sure. And we ask as we spend time in the Word of God, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, who gave this Word for a purpose, Lord, would minister to us today. You have ministered, and we pray that we'll leave this place with food in our souls, Lord, with light, Lord, for our path. So we commit what we are about to do now in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Praise God. Now we, the guys are getting back to normal. The festivity time is over. The decorations are down. And uh, I'm going to spend some time in the Word of God. We have been doing a series looking for Christ in the Old Testament. And been surprised and amazed. And, you know, it's so wonderful that your faith is built up when you see how the divine is in Scripture. A book which could only have been written by God. Because it it just cut across all the generations and the time. But that silver thread of redemption has been given. The last time we, we, we did this study, we were in the book of Hosea. And we have been following the, the listings the chronological listing is given in our, our Bible, although actually chronological in time are not actually in order. But we have reached the book of Joel. And I say that because we already looked at some of the major prophets and we're now into the minor prophets. And of course, in actual fact, Joel was one of the earlier prophets. Joel uh, was probably written before some of the other prophets but we have listed them in our Bible, the major ones, that's the big ones, and then the minor ones, and then the small ones. Praise God. So we've reached the book of Joel, and uh, before we come to our reading, I'll just let me just say something just to remind you of it. Uh, if you've read the book of Joel, praise God. Hallelujah. We, there's only a, a few chapters. It doesn't take you long to read it. We'll read one of the chapters. But I want to um, just uh, let you know something, what it's about. Uh, it talks about an invasion of locusts. <laughs> You'll probably remember these verses. Uh, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethul. That's chapter 1. It's not there. It's chapter 2. I've got up. Sorry. I just want to get this introduction launched into it. And you remember these verses, uh, Verse 4, what the locust swarm has eaten, the great locusts have eaten, what the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten, what the young locusts have left, the other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. And so we get this story, it begins with an actual disaster of a, a plague of locusts, and uh, this happened, it was a recording by Joel. Now it's interesting that Joel does not uh, talk about the kings, a lot of the prophets will tell you in the year of what king, whatever. Joel doesn't do that. And um, he also doesn't go into all the sins of the people. The people are told to repent and to do a proper job of it. He says, rend your heart and not your garments. Never mind the outward show. What's going on inside? And uh, there are certain things that are not disclosed like a lot of the prophets like Isaiah will talk about the injustices that were going on, the faulty balances, the idolatry and all the rest of it. Joel does not. But in Joel there is some amazing revelations. Now, when I was looking at this for the purposes of doing a sermon, they reckon that Joel was written about probably 830 or something that years before Christ was born. Written about the... Uh, maybe more than 800 years anyway. And one person suggested that one of the reasons there's no mention of a king, because round about that time there was an incident which happened in the history of uh, God's people. <clears throat> He's prophesying to Judah. And of course Judah is the Jews. You know there was 12 tribes and there was a division. We've touched on this, the 10 tribes split that was Israel. But salvation is of the Jews, not of the other ten tribes, but of the Judah, the, Ju the Judaic tribe. And we know in Scripture, the Bible talks about the lion of the tribe of Judah. And we have found, as we've done this study, that 
time after time after time we are told about the seed of David. That this there would be a king after the seed of David whose kingship would be eternal. And this theme has come out time and time after time. And we see it all linking together. But when we get to the book of Joel, we don't have any mention of kings. But I want to just flick away, if, you, if you'd indulge me for doing this. I want you to go to a couple of, mention a couple of things before we do our Bible reading. In first uh, Kings, second Kings rather, sorry, chapter 8, we read about something that happened. It says in uh, the fifth year of Joram, son of Ahab, that's uh, verse 16, king of Israel, when Jehoshaphat was king of Judah, Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, began his reign as king of Judah. He was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for eight years. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, as the house of Ahab had done, for he married a daughter of Ahab. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, for the sake of his servant David, the Lord was not willing to destroy Judah. He had promised to maintain a lamp for David and his descendants forever. Now I want to stop there. Because when we get to the prophet Joel, I want to show you something. That light was not going to go out. Praise God. That light. And some people have conjectured that in actual fact, for, do you know for a period of six years, there was a woman reigned over, uh, over Judah. Did you know that? Let me just show you something. Uh, if we go to... Second Chronicles and uh, <clears throat> just so I can find this here now verse chapter 22 it says when Atalia the mother of Ahaziah saw that her son was dead she proceeded to destroy the whole royal family of the house of Judah do you see what that woman's trying to do by the way this woman is destroying the whole royal family. She is trying to put out the lamp of David, the light that God said would never go out. Although the wickedness that was going on in Israel was beyond description and in Judah was going on description and judgment is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. But God promised that that lamp would not go out. And this woman set about killing all the princes to destroy the seed of David. Do you not see the spiritual forces at work? You know the devil wants to kill people. Did you know that? We'll touch on that in a minute. But verse 11 says, sorry, 14, but Jeshuba, the daughter of King Jehoram, this girl, took Jehoash, son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the royal princesses. She kidnapped him, who were about to be murdered, and to put him and his nurse in a bedroom, because Jehosheba the daughter of King Joram and the wife of priest Je Jehida was Azaziah's sister. She hid the child from Atalia so that she could not kill him. He remained hidden with them at the temple of God for six years while Atalia ruled the land. This woman ruled the land. And while she was ruling, which was not what God asked to do, he said there would be a king that would rule. There would be a king from the seed of David. But this woman moved in through the influence of satanic powers and tried to destroy the seed. Tried to extinguish the lamp. But God said that's not going to happen. And you see that, that child was hidden away with the priests in the temple until he became. And you know it struck me as I was looking at this. We're going to look at, at, at Josiah in a minute. It suddenly struck me, you know, the world gets everything upside down, don't they? Have you never noticed that? Well, if you see what's going on in politics today, it's upside down. You know, somebody said that the disciples, the other disciples turned the world upside down. They said, we need to get them out to turn it back around again. Uh -huh. Because things are upside down. They don't know whether they're boys or girls or men or women. That's what's concerning them. Anyway, I'm not going to get into politics, so stop me, please. But... There was a fella a number of years ago, what was his name, was it Dan Aykroyd, he wrote a book about the, what do you call it, the, um, he tried to say that the, um, that Jesus was married and he had, 
and there was all this, it was a fiction, you see. And people believed it, because the world's upside down, they'll believe anything, won't they? But, uh, what was the name of that book you wrote? The Da Vinci Code. The Da Vinci Code, aye. In other words, there were all these people who were secretly preserving uh, the seed of Jesus. Jesus had got married, he made a Magdalene, had babies and all the rest of it, and then this, they were protecting the bloodline, right? Of course, that's nonsense. Jesus did not get married. The Bible, Jesus actually says some people are made eunuchs. He says some people are eunuchs for the, for the kingdom of God, no, including himself. He said the Son of Man has come to give his life a ransom for many. He didn't come to have a family life. And that's all nonsense that the devil would... And people believe it. But isn't it fascinating? If they'd have got their facts all the way around, there was actually a movement going for thousands of years to protect the bloodline. Not the bloodline of Jesus. The bloodline of David. Isn't God wonderful? Look, you know I wrote his book about that and it would be a wee bit more factual. That in actual fact, things went on because... Out of the lineage of Abraham, then it was, the promise was given to David, and then there would be this eternal king, the son of David. When Jesus walked to earth, brought the brain back to me, his cry out, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Because he was the fulfillment. He was the eternal king. Praise God. He's also the, the, the priest and the prophet as well. But he was the eternal king. And when you look through the Old Testament, and you read between the lines, and you see this woman who should not have been on the throne... But thank God Joash was secreted away because God had his plan. That wee girl, you don't know here much about that wee lassie. She sneaked that wee guy away to save his life because the, the women did wipe them out. And you saw how all the evil that was going on. So maybe it was prudent for um, Joel not to actually go through all the evils that were going on at the time. <coughs> anyway, let's read the book. Of, we'll read a chapter, shall we? We'll read one chapter to give you a flavour. This is chapter 2. Now, when he goes into chapter 2, he's talking about almost like a parallel of the invasion of the locusts. But this time it's not locusts. By the way, natural disasters can bring people back to God. I don't know where we're going in 2019. Maybe we're heading for chaos. But if it's going to bring us back to God, let it come. Let it come. They're a natural disaster. I've heard about these plagues of locusts. I've, no, I've, never, I've heard about them in Nigeria. Sometimes you can have a plague of 600 million locusts black out the sky for a prolonged period of time. And when they pass by, there's not a thing left. Not a blade of grass. Not a leaf. That right? I see a uh, charity nodding her head. You know about this. It happens in Nigeria. It can move up to the Bible lands. And obviously it did on this occasion. And these people were hit with And there wasn't even any grain left to give a grain offering in the temple. Not a bit of grain was left. But then he talks about another invasion, just like the locusts. You know, the locusts' heads are just like horses. They come, they come in lines, they come in their troops, and they come almost as if they're organised. But this was the Babylonians. This was God's judgment coming. And a people who thought, no, we are God's people, we are safe, nobody can touch us. But were they safe? The prophet spoke. And the judgment was coming. This time it wasn't locusts, it was the Babylonians, who, by the way, had a scorched earth policy. Did you know that? Not only did they destroy the men, women and children, this was real judgment. They actually destroyed the property and they burnt the land. They had a scorched earth policy. The Babylonians were cruel and wicked and evil. And of course, their time would come too, but God was going to bring judgment in them. But let's read that. Let's blow the trumpet. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm in my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It's close at hand. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and blackness. Like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was in ancient times, nor ever will be in ages to come. Before them fire devours, behind them a flame blazes. Before them the land is like the Garden of Eden. Behind them a desert waste, nothing escapes them. They have the appearance of horses, they gallop along like cavalry. What a noise, like that of chariots. They leap over the mountain tops like a crackling fire consuming stubble, like a mighty army drawn up for battle. 
At the sight of them nations are in anguish, every face turns pale. They charge like warriors, they scale walls like soldiers, they all march in line, not swerving from their course. They do not jostle each other, each march is straight ahead, they plunge through defences without breaking ranks. They rush upon the city, they run along the wall, they climb into the houses like thieves, they enter through the windows. Before them the earth shakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened. Just pause there for a wee minute. We're going to talk about the day of the Lord. You see this, the parallel with the invasion of the locusts and the invasion of this army, but the day of the Lord talks about the sun being darkened, and they were going to come to the understanding that actual fact, in one sense, the day of the Lord was meted out in Jesus Christ, as we have remembered at the table this morning, when judgment was poured out in the Son of God. What happened when Christ was on the cross? There was darkness for four hours. In some sense, that was the day of the Lord's judgment. And thank God he took it for us, those of us who trust in him. Anyway, the sun and the moons are darkened, and the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. But forces are beyond number, and mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great, it is dreadful. Who can endure it? Rend your heart. Even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. Gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the, the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn by, by a byword among the nations. Why should they, they say among the people, swear as their God? Then the Lord was jealous for his land. Praise God, the Lord answers. Amen. Amen. Now that's not a call to repentance and national repentance. I see it quite a lot on Facebook. Right? People are calling out for national repentance and prayer. I'll tell you we need it. Amen. But the Lord answered. The Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. The Lord replied to them, I am sending you grain, new wine and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. I will drive the northern horde, horde far from you, pushing it into a parched and barren land. Its eastern ranks will drown the Dead Sea, western ranks in the Mediterranean Sea, and its stench will go up, its smell will rise. Surely he has done great things. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you autumn rains, because he is faithful. He has sent you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The great locust and the young locust and other locusts and the locust swarm. My great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full. And you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel. That I am the Lord your God and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Amen. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and old, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and bills of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood for the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Praise God. And so we have this promise of a restoration. 
of the Lord intervening. We read uh, about this, what is happening in, in the land, and we're told to render heart, not a garment. We're told that before the great and day of the Lord, it says that the Lord is giving an opportunity to the people. But you know, when we're talking about, we're looking for Jesus in the book of Joel, and here is Jesus on whom is meted out the judgment of God. We have this picture. And of course, if we could get a wee bit, let's actually read a wee bit of what Jesus said. He said, I tell you, whoever believes in me, this is John chapter 14. He said, they'll do the works I have been doing and they'll do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that my Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Now this promise that the Lord gave us as he prepared his disciples for his departure, his passion, and then his ascension. He said he was going to send another of the same, the paraclete. He was going to send the Holy Spirit. And Joel the prophet said that the Spirit would be given to all flesh. Now what does that mean? That means to all peoples, not just to the Jews. But something was going to happen. For those that called in the name of the Lord will be saved. And we see that even when Christ was crucified, something of the day of the Lord happened. Now, I'm not saying they're different. there's another day of the Lord yet to come. Because we read in Joel about multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Now, a lot of evangelists use that text. and it, 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 It's as if the people and the multitudes are making the decision. You'll read it in the next chapter. But in actual fact, it's not, that's not what it means in its context. It's God that's making the decisions. In the valley. And this valley actually exists. And it's the same kind of decision that Jesus talks about in Matthew when he talks about the separation of the sheep and the goats. And let, let this be put some fear in our souls. There'll come a day in, the, in the, the multitudes in the valley of decision. God is saying, you are for heaven and you are for hell. You are for heaven and you are for hell. You are, it's not us saying, oh, I'm going to take Jesus as my saviour now. How petty are we? That we think it's all up to us. They're going to be the day of the Lord. When what the politicians say means nothing. You know the politicians behave as if they have become arrogant. And they're changing natural laws. They're changing what it's been since the beginning of time. Well of course if there's no God that's fine. People can get married to lampposts if they like. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I mean, we can talk about a boy and a girl. There's adverts on the, on the bus stops now defending sheep. People are all at sea because they don't know their foundations. They don't know their origins. They don't know what God the Father said. And if you want to know who you are and what you are, ask the person that made you. I learned that lesson the hard way when I started trying to fix cars. I used to muck about. I geared boats off and all sorts of stuff. And then one day it occurred to me, maybe the person that built this thing gave us a book. And you know, it was so easy once you had the book. Thank God we've got the book. Hallelujah. But you know this, day the Lord, when the day of the Lord comes, it's God that's making the decision. You're one of mine and you're not. And that's clear throughout scripture. And that should put fear in our souls because there's only in or out. The Bible says there's no such he said, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew out my mouth. So Jesus promises he'll send the Spirit. And he, we know, of course, he went and he died on the cross. We know that the darkness came down. In fact, there is some debate among some of these people that study uh, astronomy that there could well have been a blood moon around about the time of the crucifixion. You know what a blood moon is, don't you? It's when a, a type of 
eclipse when the, blue, the moon turns blood. We've had some quite recently, although we couldn't see them in this country because it's always cloudy. It's always, you've just seen them in Sri Lanka, Tina, where you don't get so many clouds. But, we get, but you know, talking about astronomy, you know, we get things upside down. You know, we've just had Christmas and people talk about the wise men come to see Jesus. Do you know right up to the last minute the devil was trying to destroy the bloodline of David, don't you? Because when these Magi came to Herod and he heard there's a king and Herod was an instrument of Satan. He was he worked for the devil. He was in the devil's payroll. He didn't know it. But he wanted all these children killed. Right up to the last minute he wanted the Jews killed. That this king could not come forth. And of course you know people say, oh, the Magi, they must have been astrologers. You know what astrologers are, don't you? They think that your life is moved by the position of the stars when you are born. So when you were born, where were the stars? And that will affect the rest of your life. A lot of nonsense. What they didn't, and they've got it upside down. What they didn't understand was the position and the movement of the stars was affected by the place he was born. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the position of that star was affected by him being born there. The star came to the place. You ever thought about that? How the world gets everything upside down? These people weren't the astro uh, astrologers. They were people of another flesh. And what does the Bible say in Joel? That he will pour out his spirit in all flesh. In other words, this is not just for the Jew. And Jesus said, go into Samaria. Jerusalem, beginning at Jerusalem, go into Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. This is the prophecy coming to pass. Praise God. Yeah. And how do we know that what I'm saying is true? How do we know this day of the Lord that was meted out in the Lord when he met judgment in the Lord and he gave an answer to give us a hope that those that call in the name of the Lord shall be saved? And somebody once said to me, you know, we ask people to say the sinner's prayer. People need to call for themselves. They need to know in their hearts, I need salvation. I need saved. I seen a guy on the floor crying to God for mercy, screaming to God for mercy. Because the Holy Spirit had shown him the state of his life and the sin that was in his life. And how pansies are we that we just people just think they'll say a wee prayer and that's it, God dances for them. The God the Bible says repent, repent, repent. And I'm going to say something. Repentance will not come by your persuasive ability. It says when the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict people of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. And what happened when the Holy Spirit did come? Jesus' words came to pass. The prophecy came to pass. And Jesus, what he told them, he's going to send them the Spirit. And this is part of the prophecy we read in Joel. Well, let's go to it anyway in Acts. Acts 2. The day of Pentecost has happened, they did what they were told, they waited in the upper room. Suddenly there was a the sound of a mighty rushing wind, and tongues of fire sat upon all of them. And they all began to speak in other tongues as the Lord gave them utterance. And they went out into the streets, and the people thought they were drunk, remember that? And it was only nine o'clock in the morning, so the pubs were shut. Uh, and Peter had to explain that to them. I'm talking figuratively here, they didn't have pubs as such. In case you take them literally, right? Okay. okay, so anyway, Acts chapter 2, I'm at verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the living, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke, the sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Praise God. Praise God for the prophet. Praise God for the protection of that bloodline that that wee boy was spirited away to be hidden. 
And that in due time, Mary and Joseph, there came the promise that in this genealogy was born the Christ. And it's, these people make their books about the bloodline of Christ, which is nonsense. Christ completed his work. There's nothing to protect thereafter. He protects it. It's his work. And our job is to declare the gospel, but we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's one of the credentials of being a Christian, is that the Holy Spirit indwells you. And the Bible he says, He is with you and he shall be in you. Praise God. And praise God, the promise is to, to all nations, to everyone who the Lord your God shall call. And I would say in 2019, we need to wake up and say, it's time to tell people they need saved. Now, I knew that when I got saved at 14, and I'm a lot older than that now. But I need to know that again. Yeah. It's time to tell people there's going to be a day of the Lord when the, in the valley of the decisions. And they are going to be in the valley of decision. But it's either going to be you're in or you're out. And you'll be in if you're called in the name of the Lord and trusted in the finished work of Christ when Christ took our punishment upon the cross. Now we know of course that we're moving towards another day of the Lord. There's going to be the... the the end times that Jesus spoke about when he spoke to his disciples, when will the time be and the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. But as I bring this service to a close, I just want you to, to read the book of Joel and to understand the miracle of God in bringing a saviour to us. You know, we had our nativity scene and it's just like, oh, we baby was born and that baby happened to be the saviour. It goes a lot further than that, doesn't it? It goes away back to the Garden of Edom. The seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. And God made sure that all the way through these thousands of years, that seed, and then it was told, it was narrowed down, it was the seed of Abraham. Through him every nation on the earth would be blessed, not just the Jews. And then it came to David, that David, when there would be a king, who would be on his throne an eternal kingship. And we read in the book of Kings there that even though the people had broken their covenant in a terrible, terrible way, and listen, the church is not immune to God's judgment. If we don't keep our covenant, judgment will come in the house of the Lord. But thank God, God kept his promise. And that child was born. And even to the last minute the devil was trying to snuff out that lamp. He didn't manage it. If God be for us, who can be against us? We were singing with the children this morning. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. Let's discover that in our lives. Let's not be overtaken by the obstacles. Even though the locusts come and devour us. and People are saying, where is your God? As we read in the prophet Joel. The Lord said... He, those that call on the name of the Lord will be saved. We're going to close our service. We have we him here. Um.